So who knows what I mean when I talk about double entry accounting? Okay, so we've got a knowledgeable audience, so that's good. I'll skip over the, the basic stuff more quickly. Um, we're in Montreal today. What's the, um, what's the French word for double entry accounting? Does anyone know? Any French speaker? Okay. Um, the concept of double entry accounting is the same all around the world. Um, the terminology is, is different in each language, but it means the same thing. Um, who uses an accounting system for their personal finances? Yeah. Okay. Um, what solutions are people using? Would anyone like to give an example? Your new cash? Your new cash? Yep. Anything else? Ledger. Ledger. Okay. Anybody else? Any other products you're using? Okay. Um, so who is a freelancer or contractor here? Okay, um, and you're using this software for your freelancing purposes or your personal finances or both? Both? Both. For, for, for freelancing, yep. Okay. Okay. Um, and who, who runs a business that, you know, where you keep inventory or employ people? What, what's your business? Okay, and do you use an accounting system? Yes, we do. Which one? Uh, well, we use Unicash right now. Unicash? Uh, okay, very good. Okay, so I hope we can help you. Okay, um, and who supports solutions like this for other businesses as part of their job? Does anyone do consulting around accounting software or installing software for accounting? Okay, so some people have never used an accounting system before. So maybe I just ask, is there anyone who hasn't used double entry accounting software? Would you maybe put up your hand? Yep, so we've got a few people. Okay, um, so I'll go through a couple of very basic things quite quickly, um, just to bring you up to speed on what we're trying to do and then I'll go through a demo of a couple of the products we have in Debian and why it's important using them from Debian. Um, there are two aims of this talk. Um, the first is to actually show that, um, that using an accounting system um, will improve your control over your finances, whether it's your personal investments, um, whether it's uh, freelancing um, and invoicing your customers or whether it's running a business, that using one of these systems will improve the way that you manage the money. Um, and the other aim is to show you that the best choice you can make is to use free software for your accounting system. So that means a free software accounting solution running on a free operating system like Debian. Um, so people like to categorize things. In fact, research in, in neuroscience and psychology um, demonstrates that if we don't organize things um, by categorizing them and other techniques, um, then it can have all kinds of negative effects, so stress and anxiety and being disorganized and not being able to make good decisions. Um, so who's been to IKEA? Do, do you have IKEA here in Montreal? Um, so it's like a giant maze. You, you go in there for a couple of hours um, and you can come out with a wardrobe like this. Um, there's a catch. You have to build it yourself. Um, so this provides a good an analogy with accounting software. Um, but using the wardrobe, you can sort things into groups. You can put your shirts together in one place. You can put your socks in another place. 
And then you might have a couple of unusual things, like you can see the, um, the hats and the teddy bears stuffed away into corners up at the top of the wardrobe. Um, th these are problems you also have in accounting. You will have unusual transactions that you don't know where to put them. But some of the techniques for organising those accounts are very similar to organising a wardrobe. Um, who's been to Las Vegas? Or to a casino? Um, how, how much is the black chip worth? 1,000. It depends on the casino. Yeah, it can be 100 or 1,000. Um, can you tell me at a glance how many black chips there are in that picture? It's not so easy. Um, there might be a few hidden underneath. Um, have you noticed in the casino that the people stack their chips and they group them by the colour? Um, so this is what categorising things is all about. It's, it's much easier to see at a glance how much money you've got. The casino makes the chips in the different colours um, because colours make it very easy to do this. Um, they could just write the values on the face, but then you wouldn't be able to see them in a pile. So they colour them as well. Um, it makes everything go a lot more quickly. Um, so financial accounting is much the same as picking up all the clothes and off the floor and getting them into the wardrobe. Um, in finance, one of the most significant categories we use is the account. Um, so when you start setting up an accounting system, you'll, one of the first things you'll do is to set up a chart of accounts. Um, so I've created a very basic one here. Um, each transaction that you make, like paying a bill, writing a check, um, receiving some money, each transaction can be categorised by associating it with an account. It's just like putting it into one of the drawers or the hangers in your wardrobe, is you associate it with one of these accounts. Um, the accounts themselves can be categorised. Um, we can say that an account is an asset account or a liability account. It can be a, an income account or an uh, expense account. And we also have what we call an equity account. So these are the five main categories for the accounts. Um, can anyone see a, a trend in this chart of accounts? So is there something that you notice looking at this list of accounts? Expenses. Expenses, what do you notice? A lot of, a lot of expenses. Yes, so when you set up your chart of accounts, it's not uncommon to have more expense accounts than all the other types of account combined. Whether you're doing your personal finances or running a business, um, this is quite common. Um, so just looking at some of those accounts, we have a, a current account which represents you know, a bank account, a relationship we have with a bank. Um, accounts receivable, that represents money that people have to pay us. So if you're freelancing and you give a bill to your customer, then until they give you that money, it's categorised in the accounts receivable account. When you receive the money, it's in your bank account. Um, you can see a couple of liability accounts. We've got a credit card and we've got an accounts payable ac account. So the accounts payable is the opposite of the accounts receivable. Um, and then we go through the income uh, from consulting account and a number of ordinary expenses for rent, telephone, insurance. You know, most people have seen these types of expenses before. Um, so once we start processing transactions and putting them into the system, the place where they end up is called the general ledger. So think of it as like a big spreadsheet or a big database table. Um, and in the general ledger, um, we can input our bills, um, the payments we make to pay the bills, the income we receive from other people, um, and we can record the, um, 
the categories that we associate those things with or the accounts. Um, so in this first example, you've got a transaction um, with a date, the 5th of August, um, and I've specified two accounts, the telephone expense account and the accounts payable. Um, now this is a double entry accounting system, so you've got a debit and a credit that equal the same amount. Um, and what this does is it records that we now have a debt um, for 50 you know, Canadian dollars, for example, it could be 50 euros or 50 US dollars um, in the accounts payable. Um, and the reason we have that debt is because we received a telephone bill. So here's another transaction. Let's say at the end of the month, we pay that bill using cash from the current account. So we create another transaction, and in that second transaction, we eliminate the debt in the accounts payable account, um, and then we reduce the balance of the current account by that same amount. So once again, the debits on one side and the credits on the other side of that transaction are equal. Um, so if you add up everything in the debit column and the credit column, they should always be the same, even when you have millions of transactions in your system. Um, the final example um, is a bank fee. So in this case, the bank fee doesn't go through the accounts payable. The bank just takes the money out of your bank account. So the bank fees account is an expense account, um, and that's a debit of $2. And the, um, the amount is taken out of your current account. So that's a credit for $2. Um, so an accounting system is much like any other software. You can talk about it in terms of inputs and outputs. So all these little transactions are the inputs. Um, and the outputs that we get from that system are reports, um, you know, a summary of which bills you have to pay at the end of the month, for example, or a list of which customers have not paid you already, um, a balance sheet that shows how um, profitable you, you've been or how successful you are. Um, so those are the reports that we get out. So by putting in all these transactions, we'll be able to get those reports very, very easily. Um, now, it doesn't require a lot of math. One thing you might have noticed is that a lot of these transactions are, that I've shown you already are quite simple, almost boring. Um, one of the main um, themes in accounting um, can be summarized by this simple equation that your assets should be equal to your liabilities plus equity. Um, so this is really basic math. There's, not, there's no calculus or statistics or anything that you need to master accounting. Um, so looking at your personal finances, um, if you have a house as an asset, um, the liability might be the mortgage and the equity you have in the house is your, uh, it may be your uh, net worth or your savings for your retirement. Um, so it's the same equation. Um, so that's an example with some numbers. In this case, your house is worth $200,000. Um, you have a mortgage of 100000 So you have equity of 100000 as well. Um, here I've taken those figures and I've put them into a balance sheet. Um, is there anyone who has not seen a balance sheet before? OK. So the balance sheet is based on that same equation. Um, so you've got your assets, your liabilities, and your equity. Um, and they all add up. The liabilities and equity have added up to 200,000, the same as the um, assets on the balance sheet. Um, so a, a couple of years ago, I wrote a blog post comparing some of the free software solutions for accounting 
uh, mainly on, on Debian and other Linux distributions. Um, can you read that at the back? No? Well, don't worry, it's on my blog. This, this table has been cut and pasted from my blog. Um, and I'll just read the names of the packages I've compared. I won't go through every box in this table. Um, so we've got Postbooks, um, Triton, GNU Cache, uh, Ledger SMB, uh, Homebank, Scrooge, K My Money, uh, BG Finances, and Griabi, or no, Grisby. It's a bit difficult to read even up here. So these. Um, most of these are actually packaged as well. They're all free software. You can download the source code. And most of them, you can even install them with a package and start using them in two to three minutes. Um, and some of the things I've compared in the table, whether or not they have a GUI, so that's the first row in the table. Whether they have a web interface is the second row in the table. Um, whether or not they're a multi-user system. Um, whether they store data in files or in a SQL backend like Postgres, um, whether they support multi-currency. Um, some of them support the accounts receivable and accounts payable, some of them don't. If you're only tracking your personal uh, finances like investments and things, you might not worry about accounts receivable. Um, but if you're a freelancer, you will need accounts receivable. So I've basically compared most of those features. There are a few other things that you can look at in the blog. Um, yeah. So when you look at something like this wardrobe, um, there's quite a lot of effort in actually going into the IKEA store, walking around, comparing like a hundred different wardrobes they have on display loading it onto the trolley, taking it through the cash register, taking it home, then you've got to put it together as well. Um, so, so it's a big effort. It's the same thing with setting up an accounting system. Um, who set up their accounting system themselves? Yeah. Um, and how much time did it take you? Too long? OK. Like half a day, a day? Weeks, yep, a day or two, yeah. And who has actually changed from one accounting system to another? Yes. And how long did that take? It's, it's still going on. Yes, <laughs> this is not uncommon. Um, so, yeah, setting up. Uh, the accounting system is more complicated than building the wardrobe um, because you've got to take everything out and then get it back into the new thing and, and what have you. Um, it can be a huge task. So it's really important to choose the right solution at the beginning. Um, so one of the benefits of using free software um, is that you can really explore the complete solution before you commit to it, before you put in all of your business data. Um, you can download all these solutions and you could spend two or three months just getting to know them to make the right decision before you actually spend a month entering all your business data. Um, you don't change wardrobes every year. And once you set up an accounting system, you're not going to change it for maybe four or five years, maybe 10 years. Some people will keep using the same system for 20 years. Um, so the second thing to think about is that with the wardrobe, would you get a wardrobe that is smaller than what you need? Or would it be better to get a wardrobe that might be a bit bigger than what you need? That you can use some of the space later? Um, yeah. What about uh, getting a wardrobe that will fit in the room because you don't have to fit that somebody else? Yeah, so a wardrobe that will fit in the room. So with, with wardrobes, yes, this can be a problem. You may want to deliberately limit what goes into the wardrobe and throw some things away. But with. Um, with accounting systems, 
another problem that people have is when they're starting a business, like they're a startup company, they just pick whatever software is recommended by a friend or an accountant or they buy something that they find in a shop and it may be smaller than what they need. And after six months, they find that it's like a wardrobe that's too small and things are overflowing, they, they cannot close the drawers and they need to change. And then they have this crisis scenario that they have to spend three months changing their accounting system. Um, and so a second thing about free software is that you can take the most um, extensive system that has features that you'll never use or that you never think you're going to use and you can start using that system and just ignore those features for six months, for two years, maybe for five years. Um, but you know that they're there and that you can turn them on if you do want to use them in future. Um, so this is the, one of the second big benefits of using free software. Um, that proprietary um, accounting software um, thrives on making things optional, on, on having different plans and licenses and strategies to make you move on to a different product when you need a new feature. Um, with free software, there are none of these games. The license is free, um, otherwise it wouldn't be in Debian. Um, and if you're installing software for other businesses, um, then this is also important um, because your clients will choose a free software s solution that you recommend and they'll keep using that solution for many years. Um, their business will be more successful because of the flexibility of that solution um, and they will come to respect free software because it's at such a vital place in their business that every business depends on their accounting system. You know, they, they have to pay their salaries and pay their bills and pay their rent and they're using Debian-based uh, solutions to do that. So they're going to have a lot of respect for Debian and free software after they've been doing that for a few years. Um, so that's good for anyone who is in the business of uh, promoting free software and giving a, a high quality service to their clients. Um, so moving on to Postbooks, um, this is a very basic client server architecture. Um, Postbooks uses the PostgreSQL database as the server. There is no Postbooks server unless you want to run the web interface and then you need to run their web server process. Um, if you only use their GUI client on the desktop, then Postgres itself is the, the server. Um, here we've got three people running the, the GUI client and we've also got the, um, the web server and web user over on the right hand side of the diagram. But you could cut those out and just have one person running the client and running the PostgreSQL database on the same computer. In fact, the way that we're going to do the demo today is running the whole thing from the laptop. The Postgres is in my laptop um, and the GUI client is in my laptop. Um, so to install Postbooks on Debian, you can open uh, Synaptic, which is the GUI for installing packages. You can search for Postbooks. Um, that's the GUI client. Um, these are the schemas. So this is the demo schema that we're going to look at. You don't need to install all the schemas, but you will need at least one of them. Um, and you also need to install the PostgreSQL package. So we've got PostgreSQL. Um, in fact, there are a lot of PostgreSQL packages. You also need this PostgreSQL contrib package. This is all in the readme.debian so that you will get all these things. Um, and you install those with the um, package manager and then you can run it. So 
we minimise that. So when you start it, um, before you can log in, you need to load the database, which you can do from the command line. The command for that is in the readme.debian. Um, and then you can log in for the first time. We're logging into the demo database here, which already has a whole bunch of transactions in it. Um, when you're doing an evaluation, the demo database is great because you can just put things in and mess around with them. You can even delete it and load it again. But when you're putting in real business data um, and you want to use it you know, for real, please don't put your data into the uh, demo database because then your data will be mixed up with the demo data and there's no way to separate them. Um, it just popped up on the wrong screen, so I move it over here. So this is the main window. So So if we look at accounts payable, this is how we put in a bill. A miscellaneous voucher is the word they use for it in um, in post books. In other software, they might say a bill. Um, but here they call it a voucher. Um, so we choose a vendor. So they gave us the bill. We put in a date. So let's say it was today. Um, and then we put in the, the bill number or the invoice number from the bill. Um, so I've put in a number from a bill. We put in the amount of the bill. So let's say it's 100 US dollars there. This, is, this demo also supports euros and British pounds. Um, and we can tell it what the, um, the bill was for. So we can choose one of the accounts from the chart of accounts. And we'll say that bill was for how about professional services? Okay. Save. So that's down there now. We could put multiple services on the same bill. We can keep going back and adding them here. Um, but let's try and save that. And it gives us a warning. Um, a voucher for this vendor has already been entered with the same vendor invoice number. Um, so it's saying that this number has already been entered before. Um, so that means I've already entered that bill. When you've actually got a lot of bills, this is not an uncommon mistake to make. Um, and this is just one of the small things that, that you avoid when using um, accounting software to manage all of your bills and payments. Um, has anyone ever paid a bill twice? It's, you know, yes? Yeah. Th this is a, not an uncommon mistake. Um, when you've actually got multiple people in an organisation who are uh, collaborating to manage the, the accounts, um, then the probability of these mistakes increases. But the software tries to stop that with those little warnings. But we can put the bill anyway with a different number, just because we're doing a demo and we don't really care that there isn't really a bill from this company. Um, and we post it to the general ledger. And that's done. Um, So now we can go and see the general ledger transactions. The window has popped up in the wrong place again, but here it is. So if we look at all the transactions for August, and there's our debit and credit in the general ledger. Um, the important thing to note here is that by using the accounting software, 
we didn't have to remember the na uh, which amount was a debit and which amount was a credit. Um, and the software takes care of all those little details for you. Um, so this makes it a lot easier for people doing this for the first time. Um, finally, um, we can see some reports. We go to financial statements, view financial report. Once again, we have to move the window. And I'm going to ask for the basic balance sheet for August. And I query that. So there we go. We have an accounts payable uh, liability of $100 um, on our balance sheet. So everything happens quite quickly. After we put in all our bills, if we put more bills, then that line on the balance sheet would change immediately. Um, if we receive some income, then that will also appear um, as an asset on the balance sheet. At the moment, the assets are zero, so we're not in a very good position. Um, now, this is a demo database, so they actually have a lot of data in there already from previous years. So if I go backwards to about 2012, for example, I can see quite an elaborate balance sheet with a whole lot of things on it. And if you're learning accounting or if you just want to learn about the capabilities of this software um, because you've used other software and you want to make a comparison, then you can use all this data to play with and to see what it can do. Um, if you wanted to print this, um, you can click preview and you can see a nice report that you can print. Um, so if you're running a, a non-profit organisation or a community organisation, for example, and you have a board meeting um, and you want to bring some financial information to the meeting, um, then this can be a very quick way of extracting that information and having more transparency in your organisation. Um, to get these reports, you know, someone has to be putting the data in um, you know, from day to day or maybe once a month. And then if all the data is in the system, then whenever people ask for, you know, what's our position, are we solvent, are we profitable, um, you can just click and give them the answer with a nice report. Um, So the other thing I was going to bring up today is uh, Triton. So we're only going to spend a couple of minutes on Triton. Um, the Triton also has a, um, a GUI. Um, we can also install it as a package. To install Triton, you just look for Triton client. Um, the Triton server and the Triton modules all. And if you install those three packages, then everything will be on your system. Um, the readme.debian file includes some steps for setting up the database. Um, so that will take maybe five to ten minutes. And then when you've done that, you can log in to Triton for the first time. So can people read that up at the back? OK. And at the front? It's it. OK. I'll go through it quickly, and I'll explain what I'm doing. The, the font is a little bit small in, in most of these things. Um, so if we go into this financial tree, we can do various things like putting in an invoice. So here, instead of vouchers, they've got supplier invoices. So these are the bills you receive from your suppliers. 
Um, so we can go through the same process that we followed in post books. We can put in the amount, the date, um, the currency, um, You can put the invoice number from the supplier. Um, now, I've already created some journal entries in the system, so I'm just going to bring those up. Yeah, so there we go. So that's already been posted. Um, so that's a transaction for 10 Swiss francs. I set this one up using the Swiss franc as the currency. Um, and finally, we can go down to reporting, just like we did in post books. Um, we can report on the general ledger. So we can see that. Um, the 10 Swiss francs there in the revenue account. And we can see the balance sheet. So once again, th this time in this um, demonstration, we've got an asset rather than a liability. Um, so this is a more positive balance sheet. This setup is far less complete. This is not a demo database, this is an empty database. So there are a lot of basic things missing from this demo. I haven't even put in the names of any customers for this demo. That's one reason I didn't fill out the, the supplier invoice in the demo. Um, but nonetheless, you can see that it has all the same concepts that we looked at in Postbooks. Um, Postbooks is developed in C++. Um, and the Qt um, yeah, web, uh, sorry, the GUI. Um, the web interface for Postbooks is uh, based on um, uh, Node. Whereas in the um, Triton system, most of the development is in Python. Um, so it's a very different style of um, programming. Um, yeah, there are different use cases. There are some people who have specialised post books for manufacturing, um, whereas with Triton, for example, there's a very well-known product, the GNU Health, which is for healthcare. Um, so depending on the industry you're working in, um, the programming language you prefer, and all kinds of other factors, you've got to look at each of these very carefully to work out which one is going to be more relevant for you. Um, So what next? Um, you know, play with the demo databases, ask in the mailing lists and forums and things. Um, find a chart of accounts. That's usually the first step in setting up an accounting system. Um, they differ a little bit from one country to the next, and sometimes they'll be specialised for your industry. Um, and then you can just get started. The software is there, the licences are there for you to download it, copy it and modify it as you need to. Um, if why use one of these solutions? Um, it's easier to share responsibility. Um, the forms, they hide all the debits and credits for you so that people can just enter things straight from a bill. Um, and you can get the reports in just a few seconds like we did today. Um, yeah, when you're talking about money, um, yeah, one thing that people often say is that either you control your money or your money controls you. Um, and the same can be said with software. With free software, um, like Debian, with a free license, you're in control of the computer. Um, yeah, with, with proprietary software, the software and the vendor controls you. So when you put 
free software together with managing your money, then isn't it likely that you're going to have more control in the long run than if you went down any other path? Um, so I'd encourage you to, you know, to have a look at these solutions, ask any questions, use the Debian uh, mailing lists, or feel free to approach me today. Um, so thank you for coming. So. <laughs> yeah. Do, okay, so do we have time for questions? Yes. Or? Okay. So just wait for the microphone before asking questions. So, yeah. Hello. Thanks. Yeah, maybe I stand up. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, different software suits well different industry. So do you have an advice for the IT industry, like IT services? Which software would so suit better? For an individual or for an IT service company with many staff? IT service startup. Okay. Um, I think that the best thing to do in that case is to look at your skills. So if you have people who do Python, for example, then you might start looking at Triton first because you know you'll be able to maintain it in-house. If you have people who know C++, you might start looking at uh, Postbooks. And if you don't have any developers in the company, then you might look around your community um, to see what other people are using in your city. Or if you're involved in groups within Debian, for example, then you might speak to other people you know there and see what they're using. It's good to have a support network around you so that you're not on your own with these solutions. So these are all different things you could take into consideration. So, um, so we have a second question. Um, so it's not a question, it's a comment on free software usage in accounting in Germany. Um, a customer of mine was running on GNU Cash, actually, and then the tax office did a, um, an audit on them. And then, well, first of all, what was missing was a certain export feature for the German tax system that was not so problematic. But they said, actually, that the software for accounting in Germany has to be revision safe. So that includes, actually, a closed source format, because you are not supposed to reverse engineer actually what's in the accounting database. And that actually blocked, uh, from my point of view, free software completely out. It locked it out and uh, what the German tax people said actually is, no, you need to use a commercial project so that the data format is, is undisclosed. So it's not known how to actually play with that and, and manipulate the, the data in the accounting. Yeah. This is interesting because um, it's often found that this is not um, really achieving the outcome they're talking about. Um, you hear the same argument with many things. People always find ways around these artificial restrictions. It's the same with obfuscation instead of encryption. People think that if you write something like in another language, people won't understand it. Well, maybe for half a day, but then they'll figure out a way around it. But is there anyone who knows the German solution and can talk about it more? No? We just go on to the next person, though. Well, I I'm, I'm, can't talk about tax stuff and so, but I know from a general practitioner that there is a solution where uh, you should also not change your medical record of your patients, right? And the solution was to uh, build an, a hash zoom of the record and send them to some notification server. So you have no, no access to it anymore and can't change it afterwards. And this should be a solution also, also in this case, because the, the thing is not that the format is closed, but that you are not able to change it. And this would solve the problem. Yeah. Okay. I mean, in finance, they're talking about doing the same thing with blockchains, so that when banks make transactions between each other, um, like currency trades, um, they would use the, the blockchain as a public blockchain to record those transactions so everyone has a copy and it's open and it can't be modified, so they all know that the records are accurate. So. You could actually argue that to ensure accuracy, you need to have something that's open as opposed to closed. Um, so, so this we, we could have an extended debate about this, but I, I think that's worth 
you know, looking at more closely. And I, I believe there are people using free software in Germany for accounting. So that's worth looking at. So, um, so the next. Hi, um, thank you so much for your presentation today. Uh, I invited a couple of uh, people that are interested in this, but probably the rain uh, took them home. So um, I had a question for you. Um, in terms of advocacy, what do you think would be needed to break the cycle where people get advised some software and then the accountants are only trained on commercial proprietary software and then they advise people to use it and it stays into that uh, vicious cycle. What do you think would be needed to break that? Because if I, I, if I see the interface, the, the general presentation, just by the looks and feel of the software, it feels like it's ready. And I know some of these projects have been around for years and are used by thousands of people elsewhere. But what, 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 what do you think would be needed to break that cycle? Okay, so there are a few answers to that. One is to look at students who are studying accounting um, and to say, well, look, we have a solution with Debian that you can do your coursework, you can become an expert in accounting, you can run a complete accounting system on your laptop and get to know it inside out before you even graduate. Um, so for students, that's a great opportunity. Before they start working in a company, um, they might not have a lot of experience. Um, so if a lot of students get into free software early on, then they will remember that throughout their careers, even when they come across other solutions. Um, this can be achieved by working with groups on campuses, um, helping them with their events, inviting them to events like this. Um, another opportunity is to work with startup companies. As I mentioned during the talk, you know, people often choose something and then they don't change it until they have a really good reason. Um, so if they're starting their business and you get them started with a free software solution and they start using it and they write scripts and things to integrate with it, especially if they are an IT startup or an app developer, um, then they're going to be locked into that and whatever their accountant says is going to rate you know, right down here compared to the effort of changing all their scripts and reports, which is a huge effort. They're not going to change unless they really need to. They're going to change accountants before they consider changing their software. Um, so any other questions or? Okay, so yeah, maybe we have, we have time for one. This will be the last one. Okay. Just about the um, German thing, um, the maintainer of Triton, he's a German and he has a small business um, where he offers this service. So I don't know his solution, but I'm definitely sure it's possible to use Triton in Germany. Okay. Uh, I don't think so. He was last year. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much, Daniel, and everyone to come. So thank you.